Hello, good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity. My name is Wayne, I'm the youth minister here and if it's your first service with us, a special welcome to you of course as well. Now before we get into our notices, I need you to go and grab three things. First up, I need you to grab a teaspoon. Second, you need to grab a pen. Finally, you need a notepad or some paper to write on. Roll the notices. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. 
his love endures forever. Father, we thank you, we love you, we enter your courts with praise, we worship you with all our heart, mind, strength and soul. We ask that you send us out in the power of your spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome back everyone, what a great start to our service. Now, I don't know about you, but following the news that broke last week, Myself and Ruth were really inspired by hearing the tributes about His Royal Highness, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, the news that unfortunately he died. And one of the key words that came up from that was service. Service for his queen, service for his country, service for his family. And that's a really key word for us as Christians, isn't it, as well? Service. Our vision here at Holy Trinity is to love God and love others. But we could replace that with serve God and serve others too, couldn't we? Jesus repeatedly told us in the Gospels how important it is for leaders, for people, for followers to serve others. The greatest of those is the servant. So as we begin our service, I thought we'd use this verse from Isaiah 6 verse 8 that's been speaking to me. I'm sure it will speak to some of you this morning as well as we think about these things and how we can serve others. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Father, may that be our call, may that be our prayer this morning, that we make ourselves available and that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to serve others too. May you fill us by the power of the Holy Spirit to use us, to fill us, to send us out too. In your name, Amen.
As we enter this time of confession now, we're going to do something a little bit different. Many of you will have seen me use this before at church or in the youth group, and it's a structure that I use for my daily prayer life as well. They're known as teaspoon or tablespoon prayers, TSP. Not my idea, I borrowed it from Nikki Gumbel who heads up Alpha. At this point, it would be useful to get your notepad and your pen as well as we make some notes. So first up, T. T represents thankfulness or giving thanks. So why don't you start to write or draw some things that you're thankful for. As you're doing that, I'll explain the other two. The second letter is S and that's sorry. And this is where the confession comes into it. We wanna say sorry for the things that we've said, that we've done, or maybe that we've not said or not done that we ought to have. So why not think about those, particularly in the last few days or week or so. And then finally, P, please. You can often use this to pray for certain things, but today why don't you ask God challenge those things that we're giving up in confession, that please may you help me with this, or please can you give me wisdom with this as well. As you continue to write and draw, why don't I pray for us now as we enter this time of confession. Father, we thank you for your love. Jesus, we thank you that you gave your life upon the cross. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that we have you with us every step of the way today. And as we enter our time of confession, Lord, we lift up these things that we've said, that we've done, that we've not said, that we've not done this week, that we ought to have. And Father, those things that we don't understand, may you bring them to our attention through our friends, through your word, through the Holy Spirit. And finally, Father, we pray, please, please use us, please send us, and please make us a new creation in the new life that Jesus Christ offers each of us. In your holy name, amen. Let's continue in this attitude of prayer now. Prayers for Sunday the 18th of April. Risen Christ, it's only two weeks since we celebrated the shockingly wonderful story of your resurrection. When sadness was followed by confusion and then celebration, we thank you that in spite of the busyness of our world, we can worship you as a church family once again. Together and apart, we pray for your continued presence in our lives. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. In a world full of doubting Thomases, we pray that the church may be a beacon of light and certainty in the world, in our nation, and right here in our parish. We pray that Mike and our leadership team find ways to help us by balancing the running of the functions of the church with a continuing creative approach that enables each of us to grow in faith. Help them to support us as we seek to share the good news in the parish and in our local lives. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. 
Jesus lived in a world ruled by fear and oppression. Pontius Pilate found no wrong in him, yet gave in to the politics of power. All over our world, fear and oppression are still commonplace. We pray, Lord, that the world leaders are touched by your light so that they begin to put people first. We pray especially for a change of heart over COVID vaccinations, that all of the world's people can get access to protection. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. The travellers on the road to Emmaus had lost hope, their dreams shattered, yet you found them and rekindled their joy at knowing you. We pray today for all who've drifted away, for those whose faith has been challenged because they've lost people near and dear to them, for those whose lives have been turned upside down by personal financial disaster, by addiction, by sheer weariness. We pray particularly for our Queen, facing the future without her spouse after more than 70 years together. Bring comfort to her and to all people who feel their lives are broken. Help them not to drift away. Help us to keep them close to you. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. Mary Magdalene wasn't prepared to accept that Good Friday was the end of the story. She made the effort in her sadness to visit the tomb and you found her. And all the world changed. Help us when we're down and broken and when all is going smoothly. Help us to stop and seek you, to be ready to hear your call to action. Like Mary, make us ready to share the joy and the hope of Christ resurrected. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. And so as our Saviour taught us, we bring all our prayers together by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Morning everybody, uh, it's great to see you uh, again this morning. I'm sure you've uh, had the experience of uh, the same period of time seeming to travel at different speeds. You will maybe have had the experience of, of the journey to your holiday destination in the sun seeming to take twice as long uh, as the journey home back to work at cold grey Huddersfield. Or, or maybe uh, it's a, ca a date in the calendar, uh, a date that you're really looking forward to seems to take ages, whereas uh, a dreaded impending day seems to rush mercilessly uh, towards you. Time seems to go at different speeds. So take a, a period like 12 years. If 12 years ago you welcomed a new baby into your family, my guess is that those 12 years will have gone in a flash. Sleepless nights, her first words and faltering steps will seem like yesterday maybe. Starting school, learning to read and write and ride a bike, precious memories and now before you know it your little girl is not so little. She's in high school and she's on the threshold of womanhood. But if 12 years ago, after months of worry and uncertainty, you received a diagnosis, those 12 years may feel like an eternity. 
tests and more tests, visits to countless different doctors, operations, scans, and kind of the end of normal life, the end of work, the end of travel and holidays, maybe of independence. 12 years of pain and suffering and the fear of death can feel like a lifetime. Today we're resuming our journey through uh, Mark's Gospel and we're going to meet these actual characters. The father of a 12-year-old girl and a woman who has endured 12 long years of suffering. Our reading today is from Mark chapter 5 verses 21 to 43. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying, please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what they had said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So 12 years and two very different people. Two people at opposite ends of the economic, social and religious spectrum. One is a man uh, and a man with a name. He, he's Jairus, we're told. He's a man of distinction and standing. He's one of the synagogue leaders. He would be well respected, a person of wealth and prominence. 
And yet we discover that his 12 year old daughter is dying. And hearing that the miracle working rabbi is in town, he risks religious controversy, he swallows his pride, and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus in desperation. You can hear the desperation in Mark's commentary. Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And Jesus went with him. We can only imagine the, the hope and the excitement that Jairus must have felt that Jesus is going to come to his home. And then we're introduced to the second character, a woman, a woman who isn't named. She's had some kind of gynecological illness, which for 12 years has caused chronic internal bleeding, which would, according to Levitical law, have meant that she would be ritually and religiously and socially unclean. She's considered unfit to enter the synagogue. She's separated from family and community. Marriage and childbearing are an impossibility for her. And not only had she suffered from this illness, she'd suffered as a result of visiting numerous doctors, such that now she's even more physically damaged and she's financially broke. And rather than come face to face with Jesus, as Jairus was able to do, she had to slink secretly through the crowd in a desperate attempt to touch the hem, possibly just one of the little tassels of Jesus's prayer shawl as he approached. Two very different people, but they have one thing in common. They've heard about Jesus, they've run out of options, and they are desperate. They are desperate for him to touch them or touch uh, the man's child. Jairus asked Jesus to come and put his hands on his dying daughter. The woman thinks, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Desperate for a touch from Jesus. Often we, we only come to Jesus when things are desperate. Sometimes it's after we've exhausted all the other options. And actually, I want to say that it's no bad thing to be desperate uh, for Jesus. If anything, more often than, than not, I'm not desperate enough for Jesus. But maybe, like the woman in, in Mark's Gospel, we, we are just desperate for a touch. We show up to church for a, a touch of power, maybe for some sense of direction from God. And when we get it, we slip away back into the crowd, back into normal life, content with a touch. Dare I say that it's easy to treat God kind of like a, a vending machine, a dispenser of power, where we get we, we seek something and we get it uh, and it's kind of like a pick-me-up or a, a spiritual boost to see us through. But for Jesus, a touch is not enough. Look at his reaction. He stopped after she had touched him and he scanned the crowd and he says, who touched me? Of course, loads of people are touching him, but he knows that someone has touched him for a reason and for a purpose. And now it's the woman's turn to step out of the crowd, step out of the shadows and fall at the feet of Jesus. And Mark tells us that she told him her story, the whole truth. You know, Jesus does want to touch us, but he wants to do more than that. More than a brief connection. He wants to know you. He knows your story, but he wants to know you closely and be known by you. In Jesus, we see what God is like. He's not an aloof, impersonal force, 
a, a, a distant power. God is like Jesus, kind, warm, scanning the crowd, looking for us. And it's easy to, easy to feel that we're just a face in the crowd, but not so to God. Those who are in Christ are a daughter or a son of God. You know, as a father, my kids constantly want things from me. And if I'm able to, more often than not, it's an absolute delight to, to give those things to them. But I, I'm still at this precious time when my kids actually want to be with me. They want to play with me. When I've got some time off, uh, they're, they're frustrated if I don't spend that time with them. And God, who's the perfect parent, doesn't just want to give us stuff and bless us. Of course he does, and he loves it when we come to him and ask him for things. But he wants to be with you. And may we, as God's people, not simply settle for a touch and then slip away. May there be a new desperation within us to be with Jesus. Secondly, just notice that God's grace rarely operates to our schedule. God's timing and our timing are, are very different. The woman's healing is this extraordinary moment. But I would say probably not for Jairus. Put yourself in, in his sandals. The clock's ticking. Time is against him. His daughter is gravely ill. And Jesus doesn't seem to be in any sort of rush. Jesus is taking his time. He's healed this woman, this pariah. And now he's talking with her. It makes no sense. In fact, it's, it's worse. One commentator I read said that if these two people, the daughter and the woman, had been in the local hospital, in A&E, for example, a doctor who, like Jesus, treated uh, the woman with her chronic condition before the little girl who is in acute danger, that doctor would be sued for malpractice and probably be struck off. Jairus must have been absolutely fraught. Hurry up, Jesus. This woman, she's had this condition for years. This isn't urgent. Hurry. I need your help now. And of course, just as he feared, it happened. Some people came from his house to say that his daughter has died. Imagine how he must have felt at that moment after Jesus had taken so long. And so we come back to this whole issue of time and how time plays out in this story. The woman is healed, but it's not until 12 years of pain and suffering have passed. 12 long years. And the girl is healed but after she's died, not before. Maybe you've had experiences of other cultures, maybe you're from another culture, and you will know that different cultures approach time very differently. I've spent a little bit of time in Africa, and African time means that people are more important than punctuality. And, and it's an incredibly different way to live according to time. I'm going to make a massive generalisation, but my uh, suspicion is that different ages of people uh, approach time differently. I've noticed that if I give an invitation to someone who is older, and I don't know how you define that category, but someone who's older typically will arrive, from my experience, somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes before the actual uh, time of the invitation. Whereas those who are younger drift in fashionably or occasionally rudely late. 
And if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you will know that his timing is very different to, to our own. And so we see in verse 36, Jairus is kind of, you know, come on, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and just says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Kind of like, just, just trust me. It's going to be OK. There's no rush. We don't see time the way God does. Twelve years, God, and I'm still bleeding and, and no one to be with me and talk with me. And I know that some of you are in that position of waiting for God to come through for you. Jesus, my daughter has died. It's too late. Where were you? Where are you? And in many senses, there are no easy answers. And many of you know, probably all of us know, firsthand that we are not immune from pain and suffering and bereavement and sickness. And yet, I believe Jesus would still say to us today, don't be afraid. Believe in me. Trust me. I'm with you. I haven't gone. I care. I haven't left you. I'm hurting with you and I'm waiting with you. And whether he answers us immediately or whether it takes 12 years or even that answer comes in the life to come. In the vista of all eternity, one day all will be well. Thirdly, finally, Jesus is our healer. When Jesus speaks to the, to the woman in verse 34, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the word for healed there is a Greek word called sozo, which more often than not in the New Testament is translated as saved. Your faith has saved you or, or, or maybe salvation. And we use saved or salvation often as a shorthand for forgiveness, don't we? You know, I've been saved, I've been forgiven for my sins. But actually, in God's uh, economy and vocabulary, salvation, being saved, is so much bigger than uh, simply forgiveness of sins. It includes forgiveness of sins, but it's much more than that. It's all-encompassing, it's comprehensive. Jesus wants to set us free and save us in every area of our life, not just in the area of sin, but in the physical, emotional, social dimensions of our life as well. And so healing isn't this separate thing over here and forgiveness over here. It's part of God's big work of salvation as his kingdom comes. It's being set free from all the after effects of the fall, including sin and illness and death. And throughout the New Testament, this Greek word sozo is used in all the different tenses. In the past tense, we find that New Testament writers saying that we have been saved. In the present tense, that we are being saved. And in the future tense, that one day we will be saved. And some of us have this experience of God's sozo, healing, salvation power in our life. We've been healed. Many of us will have an experience of God's healing. Some of us are in the process of being healed, maybe through uh, the help of doctors or counsellors or through God's power at work in our body, on our mind. But I want to say that all of those people who are in Christ, who are followers of Jesus, will be healed. You will be healed. If you have cancer or a, a bad back or Parkinson's disease or motor neuron disease or ME or a bad hip or coronavirus, you will be healed. What we don't know is if that will be before our resurrection 
or after. But that also means that God's healing uh, in the now is temporary. Healing before resurrection is temporary. This woman is healed, but, but she will go on to die. And so will you. And yet the hope and the promise for you and for me is resurrection. That we will be saved. We will be healed. And notice as well that the healing that Jesus brings is not just physical. It overcomes death. In this Easter season, when we celebrate with joy that Jesus is victorious over the grave, here we see again his power over death. As he accompanies the close, his closest disciples and, and the little girl's parents into her, uh, her room, to her bedside, he speaks these two beautiful, gentle words to her. The first word is the word Talitha or Talitha. It literally means little girl. But essentially, this is a kind of pet name that, that a, a mother might speak to her daughter, kind of like sweetheart or, or darling. And then the second word is kum, which literally means get up. It means arise. It doesn't mean be resurrected. It means it's time to get up now. And so Jesus here is doing exactly what the little girl's parents would do on a sunny morning as she gets ready to wake up for school. He sits down on the side of her bed, strokes her hair, takes her by the hand and says, sweetie, it's time to get up now. And she does. Jesus confronts our greatest enemy, death. And such is his power that he simply takes this girl by the hand and he leads her through death. Sweetie, it's time to get up now. Jesus is showing and saying that if he has you by the hand, death is nothing but sleep. So for us today, as we come to close, how may we respond to, to God's word here in Mark? Three really simple things. May we know a renewed desperation for Jesus. Yes, for a touch, but even more so, a desperation to abide and dwell and be with Jesus. Secondly, may we know that in his perfect timing, God is working his purposes out in your life. You may feel like Jairus probably felt, come on Jesus, and that's completely fine and understandable. But may we know the assurance that God is at work. And finally, May we know the presence of Jesus, the perfect parent who has you by the hand to bring you through whatever darkness you may be facing today. And may you know that once he has you by the hand, he will never, ever let you go. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your compassion and grace shown in this account. And thank you that you never change. Pray for those today who are waiting for your healing. And we dare to pray with boldness today that your healing would come, your kingdom would come in the lives of those who suffer today. Come, Holy Spirit, bring your power. Transform broken bodies and minds. We cry out to you. Pray for those who are waiting, 
that you would be with them and may they know the assurance of your presence in this time of waiting. And for each of us, may we take hold of your hand again today as you reach out to us. Thank you that you will never let us go. And as we wait for salvation to come, as we wait for healing, may we know that we are being held by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's it guys, we're coming into land now for our service today. Before we go, thank you Mike for a great word. Thank you to everyone who has been involved in making this service happen. And thank you for joining us as well. We hope you've enjoyed it, that you feel encouraged in your faith as you move forward into next week. Why don't we finish now by sharing the words of the grace together. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Great guys, we'll see you soon. Stay safe. God bless.